Our reading for the morning comes from the opening paragraph of Ralph Waldo Emerson's first book, simply titled Nature, and published when he was 33 in the year 1836. Emerson wrote, our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. While the foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face, we only through their eyes. Why should we not also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should we not have a poetry and a philosophy of insight and not of tradition? And a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs. Embosomed for a season in nature, whose floods of life stream around and through us and invite us by their powers they supply to an action proportioned to nature, why should we grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines also today. There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. There ends our reading. Emerson felt he had good reason to feel that his age was backward looking. The day before he published that first book, he attended the bicentennial celebration at Harvard College, his alma mater. Knowing that it had been founded back in 1636 to spare subsequent generations of New Englanders an unlearned clergy. And it had done its work, but without much change in its methods. The curriculum still focused almost entirely on the classics in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Although one early Puritan minister had said, God hath yet more light to break forth from his holy word, unquote, only rarely did it seem to. He listened impatiently as college president Josiah Quincy gave a three-hour lecture on the noble history of Harvard. And then Emerson and three other restless young Unitarian ministers went across the street and repaired to a local tavern where they decided to form a new study group. It would focus on the new views of the Bible, of nature, and of much needed social change, especially the writings of the so-called transcendentalist thinkers in England and in Germany. I'm currently teaching an online seminar on theology for ministry students that rather reminds me of that group. Although, thanks to those transcendentalists, my group is far more diverse than they were. One's a UU Buddhist chaplain, hospice chaplain in Colorado, now wanting to consider serving a congregation. Another is an academic administrator at a university in Virginia where she has been ministering for the last six years to the trauma caused by a mass shooting on the campus. Teola lives out in Honolulu where he practices law and having been raised a Baptist is now a UU with, oh, what a sharp mind and a big heart. While Kelly is an administrator of a UU church in Southern California, raised an atheist, she's now exploring whether the nature of nature might be such a creative process all around and through us that it might even be worthy of being considered divine. The syllabus, which I largely inherited from a colleague who's now on sabbatical, includes an essay called Religious Naturalism by a contemporary UU thinker. Unfortunately, the author treats the topic as though it were something brand new something only now emerging, as though he were, well, maybe he is, ignorant of Emerson, or the long tradition before them 
in Western religion that claimed that there are two books to be read seeking divine self-revelation. One is that book of books, the Bible, but the other is the book of nature itself. The transcendentalists insisted that the former, the Bible, could only be read in the light of the latter, in the light of science and what nature reveals to us. Somehow a parable in the Sufi tradition comes to mind that I think Emerson and the other transcendentalists might have liked because they were among the first Americans to read the poets and mystics of other faith traditions. The Vedas, the Upanishads, the poetry of Hafiz. Several fish are swimming in the ocean, says this Sufi parable. And one of them pipes up to say, they say that there's an ocean. I've never seen it. Another fish says, that's because we're all in it. We take it for granted. But once I washed up on a beach, managed to survive, but now I realize that not only are we all in the ocean, it is in us too. And we need it. A third fish says, ah, nasty currents, predators, that's all I deal with. What's the ocean ever done for me? The wisest of the fish replies, only everything. Only everything. And so it is, say the Sufis, with us and with the infinite, the divine. It surrounds us. It's in us, yet we too often fail to see, feel, or even acknowledge with awe our ultimate dependence on the creative spirit behind nature. Emerson, you see, meant for his book to have the title Nature and Spirit, and for it to have two distinct parts. But when he tried to write that second part, words just failed him. Tomorrow, millions of Americans, including Reverend Bonnie and her husband, will experience the awe of seeing a total eclipse of the sun. That source of our planet's whole light and life will fade for minutes behind the moon. I hope some of them will look and feel it saying, don't look at me. Look at yourselves, for that's what experiences of awe tend to do. Because one reason we don't see or revere the majesty of nature itself is that the cultures that we've created on this earth, which we also swim in, are not only full of nasty political currents and outright predators, but seem to perversely polluted with plastic, both literally and metaphorically, and littered with individualistic consumerism, and all too often what one song calls a total eclipse of the heart. Late capitalism, said social critic Christopher Lash nearly 50 years ago, subverts spiritual solidarity and shared vision. And then we swim in what he dubbed a culture of narcissism, epitomized in recent years by the political rise of a narcissist in chief and of an economic order in which too often the big fish just seem to value the little fish only to feed on them rather than to swim with them. And a culture in which even the privileged indulge in more complaint and entitlement than is probably good for any of us socially or spiritually. And in which religion is rather lightly tossed aside as no longer considered of any real earthly value. This forgets that religion begins in nature and human nature. 
it arose for an evolutionary reason, to keep us in awe of the natural world on which we are ultimately so very dependent, and to remind us of the need for cooperation and human solidarity in our cultivation, both of the earth and of social relations themselves. I think indigenous peoples knew all this and have preserved that awareness rather well. But how then did the original purpose get so lost? So that religion, which is itself kind of an abstract idea with many varied manifestations, some of them still good, others pretty bad. Religion that stems from the Latin word religio, meaning to reconnect. How did it get to be considered by so many young people and others as not only unnecessary, but maybe more part of the problem than any part of a solution to the cooperation and attitudes toward nature that might help us adapt in this age of global warming and climate change. Here I, I can't help but think of what happened to the earth-centered spiritual tradition of Japan, known as Shinto. In the 20th century, it became increasingly interpreted and manipulated in a nationalistic way by military leaders that culminated in a terrible war across the Pacific. And at its end, my late friend Yukitaka Yamamoto came home from a POW camp in New Guinea, came home sickened by the violence and death that he had seen and found that his own father and his older brother had both died, making him suddenly, without any real preparation, the 99th generation of his family to be the chief priest at one of Shinto's holiest places, the ancient Tsubaki Grand Shrine, which like all Shinto places of worship, and like many Native American places of sacredness here, it's located along a stream that runs from the mountains down to the ocean. Yamamoto put himself under the bone-chilling waters of the shrine's waterfall every night at midnight for years, praying for the strength to purify not only his own thinking, but his own faith tradition. It's a rite called misogi. I've also undergone it. No photos, please. He wanted to return to the kami, or spirit of interdependence, in a, this time in a wider and more universal form. Yamamoto became active in an organization we Unitarians started called Religions for Peace. He ordained the first women to be Shinto priests over the objections of many of his more traditionalist colleagues. He blessed Shinto shrines here in California and up in British Columbia, violating the notion that, oh no, it could only be in Japan. And he became head globally of the International Association for Religious Freedom, a coalition of reformers, which we UUs also began. Given human freedom, self-interest, tribalism, much of what passes for religion sadly comes down to us as a polluted or even blood-soaked stream. And Yamamoto knew that. It stands in desperate need of purification. Yet when we return to its sources in places like Yosemite, I think we find the real meaning. Star King came back from his trips to the Sierra preaching sermons with titles like Yosemites of the Soul, the Living Waters of Lake Tahoe. 
Emerson, like Star King, saw too that much religion was almost idolatrous. Yet he never stopped testing all things and holding on to that within it which is good. He never stopped being spiritually deep and religious. When the half-gods go, he wrote, then the gods arrive. There's a passage in the back of the hymnal that's more likely written by one of the people that Emerson influenced than by him, that begins, a person will worship something, have no doubt of that. The problem, it suggests, is that in losing our reverence for the whole of humanity, of nature, we too often tend to worship something unworthy and partial. Mammon, money, self, security, sex, success, or just our own form of faith, our own race or nation. This, at its worst, leads to demagogues trading on fears built around all such things. But don't let me go into that. It is also possible for the overly critical and intellectually arrogant to contribute to the problem. Just this week, I ran across a recent interview with Richard Dawkins, the British scientist whose apt critiques of religion have made him a leader among so-called new atheists. But in it, Dawkins surprised the interviewer by calling himself a cultural Christian and admitting that he all too often took for granted the standards of civility and the rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that went with that inheritance. He almost admitted that perhaps he was naive to believe that when religion went down the drain, rationality would replace it. That perhaps he had forgotten that while nature abhors a vacuum, so does the human soul. It made me want to read to him a part of Emerson's essay, The Oversoul, which is also in our hymnal. Let us learn the revelation of all nature and thought that the highest dwells within us, that the sources of nature are in our own minds. And as there is no screen or ceiling between our heads and the infinite heavens, so there is no bar or wall in the soul where we, the effect, cease, and God, the cause, begins. Rather, I am constrained at every moment to acknowledge in events a higher origin than the will of, I call mine. For there is a deep power in which we exist and whose beatitude is accessible to us. Every moment when the individual feels invaded by it is memorable. It comes to the lowly and the simple. It comes to whosoever will put off what is arrogant and proud. It comes as insight. It comes as serenity and grandeur. The soul's health consists in the fullness of its reception. Forever and ever, the influx of this better and more universal self is new and unsearchable. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love. I wonder if when he wrote that, he thought back to the words that did not come to him for the second part of nature. For it's this purified sense of the nature of religion that needs to be restored to the needs of the human soul today, I believe. Sure, as we inherit it, it often needs a new reformation, greater enlightenment, a return to its primary purposes. But it need not preserve or idolize so many of its malformations. 
it needs to become more uniting, more universal. Yet we have forebearers in this faith tradition of ours who've always known that. It remains for us to hope that we may, in this time and place, be their worthy successors. I think of that pioneer among women in our ministry, Universalist Olympia Brown, ordained in the 1850s, saying, stand by this faith, work for it, and sacrifice for it. For there is nothing in all the world so important as to be loyal to this faith that has placed before us the loftiest ideals, that has comforted us in sorrow, strengthened us for noble duty, made the world more beautiful. Do not demand immediate results, she wrote, but rejoice that we are worthy to be entrusted with a great message, that we are strong enough to work for a great true principle without counting the cost. Go on finding ever new applications of these truths and new enjoyments in their contemplation, always trusting in the one universal spirit that ever lives and loves. So may it be in this place and in all our hearts. Amen.